Grace uh, UKZ and Park Home, and so we are online fully for this presentation. The topic for this morning is benign pathology of the ovary, and we are going to present to you this morning a clinical presentation and approach to the diagnosis and management of some of the common types of benign ovarian pathologies. Borderline ovarian tumors is beyond the scope of this presentation. We will focus on those pathologies that are considered benign. So I hand you over to Dr. Dweely, who will take us through this talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Israel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning. Um, while the word pathology might sound um, alarming, as Dr. Israel has mentioned, um, our focus will be on clinical broad approach in evaluating and management of these non-cancerous ovarian pathologies. We will explore the mysteries of ovarian cysts, tumors, and other benign conditions, how they impact in women's lives, and also conservative, conservative and also surgical approach we use to, discuss, to address them. So let's um, begin our exploration of these intriguing benign ovarian pathologies that keep gynecologists on their toes. Um, in terms of the outline um, of the presentation, um, we will start with the introduction, basic science of the ovary, investigation and management, a diagnostic approach, controversies with regards to the topic, and finally, we'll conclude. On introduction, um, ovaries are a pair of female reproductive organs located in the pelvis responsible for producing eggs and hormones. Benign ovarian pathologies are non-cancerous conditions affecting the ovaries. They can occur at any age and may cause various symptoms or be asymptomatic. Benign ovarian tumors and cysts are relatively common, affecting approximately one in 10 women during their lifetime. The overall incidence is of, the overall incidence of symptomatic ovarian cysts in a premenopausal female being malignant is approximately one in thousand, increasing to three in thousand at the age of 50. Early detection and accurate diagnosis are crucial for the appropriate management and also improved outcomes. Many ovarian masses in the premenopausal women can be managed conservatively. Functional or simple ovarian cysts, which are thin wall cysts without internal structures, which are less than 50 millimeters maximum diameter, usually resolves over two to three menstrual cycles without the need for intervention. If surgery is indicated, a laparoscopic approach is generally considered to be a gold standard for the management of benign ovarian masses. Ovarian cysts are common in postmenopausal women. The exact prevalence is unknown given the limited amount of published data and the lack of established screening programs for ovarian cancer. However, studies have estimated the incidence to be anywhere between 5% and 17%. The greater use of ultrasound in gynecological practice and the widespread generalized use of the imaging techniques such as CT scan and MRI mean that an increasing proportion of these seeds will be found incidentally. However, cyst lesions in the postmenopausal ovary should only be reported as ovarian cysts and considered significant if they are one centimeters or more in size. Cystic lesions less than one centimeters are clinically inconsequential, and it is at the discretion of the reporting clinician whether or not to describe them in the imaging report as they do not need follow up. The vast majority of these identified cysts are benign. Therefore, the underlying management rationale is to distinguish between those cysts that are benign and those that are potentially malignant. The morbidity and outcomes can be improved by number one, using conservative management where possible. Number two, the use of laparoscopic techniques where appropriate, thus avoiding laparotomy where possible. Also, a referral to a gynecological oncologist when appropriate. Also, it is important to consider 
borderline ovarian tumors as a histological diagnosis when undertaking any surgery for ovarian cancers. And when such histological diagnosis is made or strongly suspected, a referral to a gynecological oncology unit is also recommended. Preoperative diagnosis can also be difficult with radiological and serum markers being relatively insensitive, especially in their differentiation from stage one ovarian epithelial cancers. Although up to 20% of the borderline ovarian um, tumors appear as simple cysts on ultrasonography, the majority of such tumors will have a suspicious ultrasonographic findings. The preservation of fertility in patients with benign and also borderline malignant ovarian tumors must be considered because these tumors occur at a younger age than ovarian cancer. This is even more important in the current societal context where the desire for maternity is increasingly deferred to a later age. It is therefore the surgeon's duty to know how to approach this question with their patients in order to propose a therapeutic strategy aimed at protecting fertility. The psychological impact associated with ongoing monitoring of an ovarian mass should not be underestimated. A systemic review and meta-analysis of the risk and benefits of ovarian cancer screening in asymptomatic women reported that false positive results can increase cancer-associated distress with no significant impact in overall quality of life. Repeat imaging can increase patient anxiety to the point that unnecessary surgical intervention occurs even when the masses remain stable in appearance. Coming to basic science of the ovary. Ovaries, they originate from the intermediate mesoderm. They are paired gonadal structures that lie suspended between the pelvic wall and the uterus by the infantile pelvic ligament laterally and the uterine ovarian ligament medially. Inferiorly, the healer surface of each ovary is attached to the broad ligament by its mesentery, which is dorsal to the mesocelpings and the fallopian tube. Primary neurovascular structures reach the ovary through the infant or pelvic ligament and enter through the mesovarian. The normal ovary varies in size with measurements up to five by three by three centimeter. Variation in, dim in dimensions results from endogenous hormonal production, which varies with age and with each menstrual cycle. Exogenous substances, including oral contraceptives, gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonists, or ovulation inducing medication, may either stimulate or suppress ovarian activity and therefore affecting the size. Each ovary consists of cortex and medulla and is covered by a single layer of flattened cuboidal to low columnar epithelial that is continuous with the peritoneum at the mesovarian. The cortex is composed of a specialized stroma and follicles in various stages of development or attrition. The medulla occupies a small portion of the ovary in its healer region and is composed primarily of fibromuscular tissue and blood vessels. In postmenopausal women, the ovaries become smaller and chancrin and are covered with the scar tissue. In the women of reproductive age group, the developing eggs, the oocytes, are contained by fluid-filled cavities called follicles present in the ovarian walls. The ovaries lie above the pelvic rim at the time of birth and do not descend down until cavity of the pelvis deepens during childhood. In the pubertal women, the connective tissue capsule over the surface of the ovary is covered by the smooth layer of the ovarian mesothelium or surface germinal epithelium. This usually comprises of single layer of cuboidal cells and is usually continuous at the helium with the peritoneum and also the mesovarium. These cuboidal cells, they lie in a dense layer of connective tissue, the tunica albigenia, and give the ovarian surface a dull grayish appearance. And after puberty, the surface epithelium becomes progressively scarred and distorted because of the repeated rupture of the ovarian follicles and discharge of oocytes during ovulation. Graphene follicles are interspersed throughout the stroma, and some of them may be seen bulging at the surface of the ovary. They vary in size according to the stage of development. And following ovulation, the follicle collapses 
and the granular cells enlarge and multiply, taking on a yellow pigment, the lutein and the fatty material to form the corpus luteum, which persists in the event of fertilization for a few months. And in the absence of fertilization, the corpus luteum functions just for under two weeks before degeneration to form a pale corpus albicans. A female is born with oocytes in her ovaries. No new oocytes develop after birth. And between 16 to 20 weeks of gestation, the ovaries of the female fetus contain about six to seven myelon oocytes. Most of these oocytes gradually die away, leaving about one to two million oocytes to be present at birth. At puberty, only about 300,000 oocytes remain, of which only a small percentage mature into eggs. The many thousands of oocytes that do not mature will undergo degeneration. Degeneration is usually completed by the time a woman attains menopause. The blood supply to the ovary is the, is the ovarian artery, which anastomizes with the uterine artery. And the innervation of the ovary is the ovarian plexus and or uterovarian plexuses. The pathology of the ovary varies somewhat from the remainder of the female genital tract since in addition to being covered with the marine derived surface epithelium and containing a stromal component, the ovary also contains germ cells. The ovaries are the organs which are responsible, as we have mentioned, for the production of the female germ cells, the ova, and the female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, in the sexual mature female. The ova responds to FSH and LH in a defined sequential manner to produce follicular growth, ovulation, corpus luteum formation. The cycle is designed to produce an optimum environment for pregnancy. Should this not occur, the cycle begins again. The ovary produces estrogen in the early menstrual cycle, which is responsible for the endometrial growth. Following ovulation, progesterone is already produced in a significant quantities, which transforms the endometrium to a form ideal for implantation of the embryo. If no pregnancy occurs, the ovary ceases to produce estrogen and progesterone. The endometrium is loved and the cycle begins again. The three major groups of primary tumor of the ovary may therefore be classified into those derived from epithelium, the sex cord stroma tumors, and also the germ cell tumors. Um, we further classified the benign ovarian pathologies of the ovaries as follows. We have what a follicular cyst, and a follicular, sorry, functional cyst, under functional cyst, we have got a follicular cyst, the corpus luteum cyst, and the thicker luteum cyst. We also have got benign ovarian pathologies. Under, we have got epithelial, germ cell, sex cord, stroma tumors. We also have got other pathologies, such as the endometrioma, the tubovarian abscess, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, and lastly, ovarian emergencies. For a functional cyst, during ovulatory menstrual cycle, follicles develop and rupture, releasing a mature ova. Follicular cysts arise when this physiological release fails and the follicular growth continues, either from excessive stimulation by the follicular stimulating hormone or from the lack of normal pre ovulatory recognizing hormone surge. Follicular cysts rarely grow larger than 10 centimeters and most are asymptomatic. Large assist may cause pelvic discomfort or heaviness. If the granulosa cells lining the follicles is produce excessive estradiol, menstrual irregularities characterized by a prolonged intermenstrual interval followed by menorrhagia results. Follicular cysts typically are thin-walled, unilocular, and appear simple on ultrasound as shown on the image. The clear to straw colored fluid filling these seeds is hyperchoic on ultrasound and results in a low T1 weighted signal intensity on it and high T2 weighted intensity on MRI. Observation is appropriate for the suspected follicular seeds because more than 70 to 80% will resolve spontaneously. And what about the corpus luteum cysts? Activation of the follicular LH receptors by the pre-ovulatory LH surge triggers ovulation 
and rapidly initiate terminal differentiation of the follicle in the corpus luteum. In the absence of pregnancy, the corpus luteum has a program lifespan of about 14 days. When supporting conceptors, the corpus luteum maintains its hormonal secretion during the first trimester. Its size remains static from five to nine weeks gestation with a mean diameter of 17 millimeters and then gradually regresses with almost 20% undetectable by the 10 to 13 weeks. Central hemorrhage in the corporal uterus is normal, but expansion of the cavity may result in corpus luteal cyst formation, which arbitrarily is distinguished from the diameter, which expands to three centimeters or greater. Clinically, the corpus luteum cyst may produce a dull unilateral pelvic pain. And depending on the degree of progesterone production, menses may be delayed, followed by heavier than normal menstrual bleed. Hemorrhagic corpus luteum cysts have a variable echogenic pattern on ultrasound, depending on the degree of clot formation and also liases within the cyst. Internal hemorrhage usually results in high signal intensity on T1 weighted MRI. Infrequently, Ruptured hemorrhagic corpus luteum cysts can result in hemoperitoneum requiring surgery. These complications occur more frequently in anticoagulated patients or those who have congenital coagulation dysfunction. More often, women experience discomfort when, when ongoing bleeding results in increased intraluminal pressure within the cyst. The rupture may cause acute pain, but bleeding is typically self-limited. As with other functional cysts, most corpus luteal cysts are asymptomatic and will resolve with observation. Those that do not cause discomfort can be managed conservatively with analgesia and potentially serial blood counts if necessary in the otherwise stable patient. The thicker luteal cysts are the least common functional ovarian cysts. They result from hypersensitivity to or excessive stimulation from beta ACG commonly in settings of gestational trophoblastic disease, multiple gestation, or exogenous ovarian hyperstimulation. Approximately 15% of patients who have molar pregnancies have thicker luteal cysts. These thicker luteal cysts are commonly bilateral and may result in a massive ovarian enlargement, a condition also mm -hmm. referred to as hyperreaction luteinalis. Histologically, they, there is a marked luteinization and also hypertrophy of the thicker internal layer. The thicker luteinases detected during pregnancy are common diagnosed during the second trimester when the serum beta ACG peaks, although growth and resolution do not always correlate to the beta ACG levels. Women who have smaller seeds may be asymptomatic, but as the seeds grow, they can cause significant mass symptoms. There's an approximately 3% risk for acute complication attributable to torsion or hemorrhage. In pregnancy, the thicker luteal cyst results in up to 30% rate of maternal androgen access. They are usually suspected by palpation or with ultrasound confirmation. If the surgeon encounters thicker luteal cyst during the grand section or hysterectomy for trophoblastic disease, the ovaries typically appear lobulated with multiple bluish gray thin walled cysts. This cysts should be handled gently and left intact. Attempts to drain or decompress may result in significant bleeding that is difficult to control. They usually resolve spontaneously as beta ACG falls. For benign ovarian tumors, the epithelial, Serous adenomas account for about 25% of benign ovarian tumors. They are bilateral in approximately 20% of cases and may be unilocular or multilocular. Histologically, they are lined by a single layer of flattened or columnar cells, frequently with cilia, and they are differentiated along the lines of the fallopian tube mucosa. Some serous adenomas have a small raised papillary excellence on the cyst wall and some have a fibrous component and attempt cystoadenofibromas. Serous adenomas, they lack the typical molecular signatures of a true neoplasm, 
which research studies indicate they may develop from hyperplastic expansion of epithelial inclusions. This is the attempt to persist and excision is, a, is definitive. When they are small, less than six centimeters without any other concerning features, expected management is reasonable. With the mucinous cyst adenoma, which are characterized by a single layer of columnar cells, which forms the cyst wall, which differentiates along the endocervical or intestinal pathway. These tumors, they contain thick mucinous material and are often matilotulated and may form a honeycomb structure within the sector. They frequently grow large with a mean diameter of 13 centimeters. Multiple reports describe a massive mucinous cyst adenomas weighing from 150 to more than 300 pounds. They are bilateral in only 2 to 5% of cases and occasionally associated with the macho cysteratomas and brema tumors. Mucinous cyst adenomas often necessitate surgical removal because size and mass symptoms, and these, uh, and these same features may, may make them more prone to torsion. If the surgery is necessary, the surgeon should inspect the appendix because they may be concurrent appendicidial mesocell. The prematumas are rare and most are benign. They are often found incidentally associated with other ovarian neoplasm. They are usually small, unilateral, solid humans with a gray-white world appearance in a cross-section. Microscopically, they are morphologically similar to urethelium, likely because of Wolfian differentiation rather than Mullerian. They consistently express P63 similar to a normal urethelium and transitional cell carcinomas. In contrast, the other ovarian neoplasm and malignant prematumas do not express the P63. This differential expression may aid in the diagnosis and suggest the role of the prematumar carcinogenesis. Because these are solid tumors, excision is indicated and also curative. Germ cells. Machocystic teratoma developed from topidopent germ cells and are composed of tissues derived from one or more of the three primitive germ cells. The scientific community now accepts the pathogenic theory of origin, which is bolstered by the anatomic distribution of these tumors along the lines of migration of primordial germ cells from the yolk sac to the primitive gonads. Cytogenic studies further support origination from a single germ cell after the first meiotic division. Machocystic teratomas are the most common tumors of the ovary with incidence peaking in the second and third decades of life. Bilaterality occurs in about 8 to 14 percent, and they have a mean diameter of about 5 to 7 centimeters, although they may grow much larger. When diagnostic diameters arise, MRI identifies machocystic teratomas with sensitivity and specificity approaching 100 percent and 99 percent, respectively. The MRI is characterized by loss of T1 weighted signal when fat saturation is applied. Post calcifications may also be seen on radiographs and also CT scan. Grossly, sebaceous material commonly have film matrices that can be found on the teratomas. A solid nodule, the Rotikansky protuberance, often produces into the cystic lumen and contains bone or teeth. Histologic study may reveal tissues from any of the three gen layers, including adipose tissue neural tissue, intestinal mucosa, bronchial mucosa, bone, cartilage, teeth, smooth muscle, and thyroid tissue. Complications of the ovarian teratomas include torsion, rupture, infection, hemolytic anemia, and malignant degeneration. Torsion is the most significant cause of morbidity, occurring in 3.5 to 11% cases. These teratomas really rupture spontaneously, with this complication occurring in less than 1% of cases in most services. Sudden rupture may lead to shock or hemorrhage with acute chemical peritonitis. And chronic leakage induces granulomatous peritonitis, difficult to distinguish from grossly from mesothelitic cancer. Other rare complications include infection, unexplained autoimmune hemolytic anemia that resolves on teratoma excision. In its pure form, 
the overall match of cystic teratoma are benign, but in 0.1 to 1.4% malignant transformation occurs. Although any of the components may transform, malignant degeneration of the squamous component is the most common. Surgical excision is indicated as teratomas persist, and, look, and longitudinal studies have demonstrated a mean increase in size of 1.8 millimeters per year. Cystectomy versus oophorectomy should be based on the patient's reproductive desires and hormonal status. Laparoscopic excision is reasonable for the most teratomas. Rates of intraoperative spillage vary widely, with two recent series reporting ranges of 18 to 42%. In the report by Lebeji and Levesky, increased intraoperative spillage during laparoscopy compared to laparotomy did not result in increased postoperative complication, but there was a higher rate of recurrence of 4.2% versus 2.8%. If spillage does occur, copper saline lavage may minimize the risk of chemical peritonitis, which occurs in less than 1% of laparoscopic managed cases. For sex cord stromal tumors, the thicomas are stromal tumors with a lipid containing cells that resemble thicker cells. They are typically unilateral solid yellow masses. These tumors occur in postmenopausal in patients in 80% of cases and often produce estrogen. Because of this unopposed estrogen, in the large series reported by Jocom and Silsart, 60% of patients represented uterine bleeding and 21% and had endometrial cancer. Appropriate management in patients desiring future fertility is unilateral salping of erectum, and consideration of endometrial sampling is important. If childbearing is complete, the surgeon may consider unilateral or bilateral salping of erectum with hysterectomy to evaluate the concurrent endometrial hyperplasia and neoplasia. Luteinized thicomas contain stereotype cells that resemble luteinized thicker and are in a fibromastitis background. They occur in younger patients with an average age of 46 years, and only half of these tumors produce estrogen. The other luteinized thicomas are either non-functional, about 39%, or atrogenic in about 11%. The fibromas are also benign stromal tumors. They are composed of spindle-shaped cells resembling collagen-producing fibroblasts. They occur most frequently during middle age and range in sizes from microscopic to quite large. Although fibromas are usually asymptomatic and non-stereogenic, they can be associated with two unusual clinical syndrome, the Mick syndrome and Collins syndrome. Mick syndrome is characterized by ascites, a right-sided pleural effusion, a fibromas ovarian tumor, and the resolution of these symptoms following removal of the tumor. Patients who have Mick syndrome can have an elevated CA125 with values greater than 5,000 international units described. Mick syndrome is rare, However, 10 to 15% of fibromas presenting with ascites and only 1% presenting with both ascites and prolar effusion. Ascites likely occurs through transudative mechanism whereby the tumor produces fluid faster than the peritoneum reabsorbs it. With Golding syndrome or basal cell liver syndrome, it is characterized by basal cell carcinoma early in life, keratocytosis of the jaw, calcification of the dura and ovarian fibromas. Ovarian fibromas in patients who have Golden syndrome are typically bilateral, multinodular, and calcified. They can sometimes be visualized on abdominal radiograph. Although traditionally described as histologic spectrum, compelling evidence points to different origins of the thecomas and fibromas within the ovarian stroma. Nocito and colleagues concluded that the comas originate in the ovarian medulla given the histological presence of arteries, lymphatics, and mast cells. The ovarian medulla also contains teratogenic stroma. Conversely, Reeves and colleagues reviewed 125 ovarian fibromas and found that, that the architecture of these tumors recapitulates the ovarian cortex with long fascicles of fibroblasts and fibrocytes, 
and the absence of arteries, lymph vessels, and muscles. The comas likely originate in the stromal medulla, where less fibromas originate in the stromal cortex. Coming for endotriomas, endometriomas likely from other in, um, likely form after invagination of the endometric tissue into the ovary because of the prevalence of endometriosis and may be one of the most common causes of ovarian enlargement. Endometriomas occur more frequently on the left ovary with one group hypothesizing that the sigmoid colon prevents recycling of the endometrial cells throughout pelvis. Endometriomas may vary from small blue black subcentimeter implants to larger multiloculated hemorrhagic cysts. They classically have a ground glass appearance as seen on the image on ultrasound with heterogeneous low level echoes. Solid areas of clot and internal hemorrhage cause high signal intensity on T1 weighted MRI. Treatment with general H agonists may decrease the size of the endometriomas but it rarely eradicates them. Many therefore prefer surgical management for a definitive diagnosis and treatment. Studies evaluating cyst drainage versus cystectomy found up to 80% recurrence rate after drainage alone, compared to reoperation rate of 23% at 18 months for patients undergoing cystectomy. In the same study, Patients who underwent fenestration of the cyst with ablation of the cyst wall had a reoperation rate of 58% at 18 months. And the meta analysis comparing the cystectomy to fenestration and ablation of the cyst wall found cystectomy to have a lower rate of further surgery and dyspareunia. This data suggests that cystectomy or oophorectomy is appropriate for the management of endotriomas. It is also recommended by the ASHRAE to offer surgery as one of the options to reduce endometriosis-associated pain. Clinicians can consider hysterectomy with or without removal of the ovaries, with, remo with the removal of all visible endometriosis lesions in those women who no longer wish to conceive and fail to respond to more conservative treatments. Women should be informed that hysterectomy will not necessarily cure the symptoms or the disease. Your bovine abscess is a complication of a pelvic inflammatory disease, but it can also result from bowel perforation or pelvic malignancy. TOA is okay when the bacteria pass into the peritoneal cavity and form an abscess in the closed space surrounded by the pelvis and reproductive organs. An endoperic environment is created as the blood supply to the stand of the abscess is compromised. Most infections are polymicrobial with high prevalence of gram-negative organisms, streptococcal species, and also anaerobic organisms. CT scan imaging frequently demonstrate TOAs to be multilocular with fluid density. Furthermore, TOAs can also have thick, uniform enhancing wall, thickening of the mesosalpins, and infiltration into the pelvic fat. The color Doppler sonography demonstrates a hypervascular blood flow to the borders of the mass and septa in 90% of patients. And the treatment of the suspected tubovalent abscess initially consists of broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics with anaerobic coverage and inpatient observation. Described regimens include kefatazine or kefatoxin plus doxycycline, gentamicin plus gentamicin, Levofloxacin or ofloxacin plus metronidazole and doxycycline plus metronidazole. If a large abscess is identified or a patient fails medical therapy, drainage should be performed because most patients are of reproductive age with desire for future fertility. Conservative therapy is the usual is the goal is the usual um, goal. Transvaginal and transglutial and laparoscopic drainage have all been described with each achieving greater than 90% success rate. The clinical situation and location of the abscess ultimately dictate the optimal route of drainage. And more than three fourths of patients become afebrile within 48 hours after drainage. And more than 90% of patients respond by day three to five. Those which are unresponsive for four to five days after drainage should be re-evaluated 
and if clinically indicated, taken to surgery for resection of the infected tissue. And PCOS. The polycystic ovarian syndrome is a disorder which is characterized by hypoadrenogenism of lateral dysfunction and also polycystic ovaries affecting between 8 and 13% of women in their reproductive age. Its etiology remains unknown and treatment is largely symptom-based and empirical involving lifestyle modification, pharmacological and also surgical intervention. PCOS has the potential to cause substantial metabolic sequel, including increased risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And these factors should be considered when determining the long-term treatment. Women with PCOS commonly present with menstrual disorders from amenorrhea to menorrhagia and infertility. Skin disorders, especially those due to peripheral androgen excess, such as hirsutism and acne, and to a lesser degree, androgenic alopecia, are common in women with PCOS. For diagnosis, it is recommended to use the modified rotatum criteria in which PCOS may be diagnosed if any two of the following are present. Clinical or biochemical hyperatronogenism, the evidence of oligoovulation, and polycystic ovarian morphology on ultrasounds with the exclusion of other relevant disorders. The polycystic ovarian morphology includes equal to uh, 20 or more than follicles per ovary in either ovary, or if the ovarian volume is more than 10 cubic centimeter, also based on transvaginal ultrasound with a transducer frequency more than eight megahertz. For ovarian images, ovarian torsion is the fifth most common gynecological surgical emergency and can occur in all age groups. Although it is the most common in women of reproductive age with the mean age representation between 29 and 34 years. It occurs when ovary rotates around the infantile pelvic ligament, or if the ovary ligament resulting in partial or complete occlusion of the blood flow to the ovary. This leads to venous congestion, hemorrhage, and tissue ischemia if the occlusion is not reversed. The risk factors of ovarian torsion include ovarian mass, ovulation induction, polycystic ovarian syndrome, pregnancy, previous history of ovarian torsion. Classical symptoms of acute onset in neutral pelvic pain associated with vomiting. However, in a 15-year review of ovarian torsion presentation at the emergency department, sudden onset pain was only present in 59% of cases, while associated vomiting was present only in 70% of cases. Hematological and biochemical investigations indicative of inflammation such as white cell count and C-reactive protein are raised in approximately 50% cases but of low sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis. And the presence of ovarian mass more than five centimeters in diameter has been found to significantly increase the likelihood of diagnosis of ovarian torsion with an odds ratio of 10.6. Of note, however, it is that 10% of the ovarian torsion occurs in women of with normal ovaries. The specific ultrasound features of ovarian torsion have been described. These include the unilateral ovarian enlargement with peripheral arranged, arranged follicles occurring as a result of occlusion of venous blood flow and subsequent edema. Areas of echogenicity consistent with the hemorrhage resulting from the same pathology process are also common findings. While dopa flow is normal in the majority of the presenting patients, impaired or absent of the flow is found to be associated with ovarian ischemia at the time of surgery. This likely represents the stage of disease process as well, whether the torsion has led to complete or partial occlusion of the arterial blood flow. Management of ovarian torsion in premenopausal women is dependent on the patient factors, including their age and the desire to, pres to preserve fertility, as well as disease factors, including the size of the total ovarian mass, the degree of suspicion of malignancy, and the clinical appearance of, of the ovary at the time of surgery. The treatment of ovarian torsion is surgical detorsion. After detorsion, ovaries were found to be functional in greater than 90% of patients who underwent detorsion. This was assessed by the appearance of the adnexa on ultrasound, including follicular development of ovaries by Osner G et al. Therefore, surgery with adnexal sparing is the management of choice. If the cyst appears to be malignant, or if the woman is postmenopausal, Salpingophorectomy is a preferred management. 
Now coming to um, investigation and management, a diagnostic approach. So we'll begin by exploring the clinical presentation where we'll highlight the various symptoms and signs that guide our diagnostic process. Following that, we'll delve into the imaging techniques, discussing how advances in radiology assist in making the diagnosis. Next, we'll talk about the tumor markers and their role in benign ovarian pathologies. This will set a stage for us exploring the management strategies where we'll compare conservative versus surgical options, weighing the benefits and challenges on each approach. Finally, we'll touch on fertility pre uh, preservation and also benign masses in pregnancy. On clinical presentation broadly, a thorough history and examination are important in the assessment of a patient with benign ovarian pathologies, as the diagnosis may be anticipated. Patients should be specifically asked about symptoms suggestive of acute torsion, such as intermittent or severe pain, or symptoms of endometriosis, such as dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, dyskesia. Fever, chills, and vomiting may be signs of tube ovarian abscess. Symptoms associated with malignancy should also be considered, including abdominal distension, early satiety, urinary frequency or agency, and also abdominal pelvic pain. Previous gynecological and also surgical history should be elicited, specifically regarding any previous ovarian cyst or breast or bowel malignancy. The female history is also important and should include inquiries about breast or ovarian cancer, bowel or endometrial cancer. Examination should include abdominal and bimanual examination to assess for palpable annexal masses and any palpable endometric nodules. Clinical examination for local lymphadenopathy should also be included. Assessment for tenderness, mobility, and nodularity and the presence of ascites is important in risk um, stratification and also preoperative planning. It is also important to consider nine biological causes of the pain and abdominal distension during assessment. It is also important to note that clinical examination has a poor sensitivity in the detection of ovarian masses, about 15 to 51%. Its importance lies in the evaluation of mass tenderness, mobility, nodularity, and also ascites. On imaging techniques, Ultrasound is the first line imaging modality for initial evaluation of benign ovarian masses. The advantages of ultrasound over other imaging modalities include accessibility, relatively low cost, fast, portable, and does not involve ionizing radiation. And the limitation of ultrasound may include operator dependence, limited views in obese patients, and obscuration secondary to overlying bowel gas. So it is recommended that transabdominal and transvaginal pelvic ultrasound be performed in combination with colored Doppler ultrasound. Two approaches are recommended for evaluation of the adnexal mass. The first is the subjective pattern recognition to distinguish benign from malignant masses and to distinguish ovarian, paraovarian, and fallopian tube masses or cysts. Patients, patients with characteristically benign masses can be managed conservatively with serial ultrasounds as appropriate. The majority of masses that are categorized as benign on ultrasound will resolve or remain unchanged over time, particularly in asymptomatic patient. Monitoring with serial ultrasound over the short term, preferably conducted in the proliferative phase for premenopausal women, can identify any rapidly changing masses and avoid unnecessary surgical treatment for stable patients. If a mass is determined to be low risk for malignancy on ultrasound, a repeat scan is recommended in eight to 12 weeks after the initial assessment. For masses that demonstrate a classic benign features on ultrasound, the frequency of imaging can be reduced yearly for five years. However, the optimal interval for serial sonographic monitoring of benign appearing masses has not been established. As ultrasound can be interpreted by practitioners with varying degrees of expertise and confidence, a referral to expect sonographer may be indicated when the evaluation is indeterminate. The second approach is, is to use the risk prediction models, of which the best related model is the simple rules developed by the OTA group or the ADNEX. 
There are risk prediction algorithms, in particular, the OTAS uh, simple rules and ADNEX models have been shown to aid in assessing the risk of malignancy of a given mass. The ADNEX um, is a diagnostic prediction model that estimates the probability that a tumor is benign, borderline, stage one primary invasive, or stage two to four primary invasive, or secondary metastatic developed by um, age group based on three clinical and six ultrasound predictor variables. These clinical variables are age, serum levels of the biomarker, and cancer antigen 125, and the type of center, that is oncology versus other. The ultrasound variables are, are at the maximum diameter of the lesion. Proportion solid tumor defined as the largest diameter of the largest solid component divided by the largest diameter of the lesion. The number of the papillary projections, the presence of more than 10 cis locules, and the presence of, of caustic shadow and ascites. The simple rules use standardized terminology and compromise five features that suggest malignancy, the M features, and five features and five um, features that suggest um, um, uh, B features. The sonographic features that suggest it for malignancy include a solid component with strong or central blood flow as per elevated color, top, uh, color score, more than four papillary projects, strings as defined as more than three millimeters in height, a thick multiple irregular septations, ascites and peritoneal nodularity, and masses with largest diameter more than 10 centimeters or containing more than 10 locules. The B features, unitolysis, presence of solid components where the largest solid component is less than seven millimeters, the presence of acoustic shadowing, the smooth multilocular tumor with the largest diameter less than 100 millimeters and no blood flow. These large multicystic masses are associated with the increased risk of malignancy, specifically in borderline ovarian tumors. If one or more M features apply in the absence of B features, the mass is classified as malignant. And if one or more B features apply in the absence of M features, then the mass is classified as benign. In both B and M features apply, if no rules apply, then the mass is considered indeterminate. The simple rule do not apply to as many as 25% of masses. In this case, the author group suggests either referring the patient to an expert sonographer or labeling the mass as possible malignant given the high prevalence of malignancy. Patients with a mass suggestive of malignancy should be promptly referred to a gynecological oncologist to facilitate the triage and care in a timely fashion and where resources permit. The referring physician should order tests for tumor markers. An X-ray examination also serves to determine the presence of hydrothorax, whether there is abnormal fluid or not in the chest, like a tooth or a tumor. It if there is a strong suspicion of metastatic disease or carcinomatosis, the referring physician can also request a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, or pelvis as appropriate to help expedite the diagnosis process. MRI can be used also as a problem-solving tool in the case of indeterminate result on ultrasound or when the ultrasound does not adequately catalyze the adnexal mass. And in the case of indeterminate mass, MRI decreases the risk of misdiagnosis, a benign mass as malignant, and increases the specificity of a benign diagnosis. MRI has also high sensitivity of 96.6% and a specificity of 83.7% for the diagnosis of malignancy. In a prospective cross-national study by Dina Emal Dudley et al. conducted at Cal Al An Hospital in Cairo between April 2016 and October 2018 of 396 women with ovarian masses measuring more than five centimeters who were candidates for surgery found that aorta simple rules are an effective tool for detecting ovarian malignancies when performed by non-expert sonographers. When results are inconclusive, pattern recognition to be performed additionally by an expert sonographer. The objective of the study was to compare the efficacy of the intentional over tumor analysis simple rule versus the pattern recognition to differentiate between benign and malignant over masses. Also, a randomized control trial assessing the surgical intervention rates on the oncology, oncologic safety and decision-making process using the MRI-based protocol developed by the British Royal College of Obstetrician and versus the triage using the IOTA simple rules show that IOTA protocol resulting in lower surgical intervention rates compared to the RMI1-based ROSOG protocol. 
The AOTA simple rules did not result in more cases in which diagnosis of cancer was delayed. For laboratory tests and tumor markers, once an agnesal mass has been identified, laboratory testing may assist with differential diagnosis and identifying women who have increased likelihood of malignancy and determining whether a gynecological oncology assessment is needed. And for all women of childbearing age, the first requirement is a pregnancy test. Any women with a history of symptoms suggestive of ovarian abscess should undergo testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Complete blood count can also identify leukocytosis, which may be associated with infection. And the most studied biomarker for the assessment of pervic mass is the serum cancer antigen 125, which is a glycoprotein often elevated in patients with epithelial ovarian, fallopian tube, and peritoneal malignancies. This marker is non-specific and can be elevated both in benign and also malignant conditions. And many gynecological conditions such as menstruation, pregnancy, endometriosis, and benign pelvic masses and pelvic inflammatory disease and non gynecological conditions such as cirrhosis can result also in elevated cancer antigen levels. The cancer antigen 125 testing is not recommended as a screening tool. And multiple large population-based trials evaluating cancer antigen 125 screening in combination with ultrasound imaging concluded that screening increases interventions in the, in, uh, in the screened women with the resulting in morbidity. And there is no statistical significance in the level of mortality from ovarian cancer between the control group and the screened patients. And routine screening in asymptomatic women is not recommended at this time. When used to distinguish between benign and malignant diseases, cancer antigen 125 testing has been found in meta-analysis to have a sensitivity of 73% to 79%, with a specificity of 82 to 86% when using cutoff value of 35. Of note, only half of early ovarian cancers had elevated cancer antigen 125 compared to 80% of advanced ovarian cancers. Most importantly, the levels should not be used in, in isolation to determine if a cyst is malignant. While a very high value may assist in reaching a diagnosis, a normal value does not exclude ovarian cancer due to a non-specific nature. The evaluations have been done also to use of cancer agent in combined with other tests in order to increase the sensitivity and specificity. The risk of malignancy index, which incorporates sonographic features menopausal status and cancer antigen 125 level has gone a thorough several limitations. The MRI combines the three pre-surgical uh, features. It is a product of the ser uh, serum one, uh, CA125, the menopausal status, and also the ultrasound score. And according to the meta-analysis performance, the characteristics of version one RMI, which has a cutoff value of 200, demonstrate a sensitivity of 72%. And the CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis should be performed for all postmenopausal women with the ovarian cyst who have an MRI score greater than or equal to 200. Although MRI threshold of 200 is recommended, benign conditions may cause elevation of the MRI score and any malignants may not. Those women who are at risk, who are at low risk of malignancy, also need to be triaged in those with the risk of malignancy insufficient low to allow conservative management to those who still require interventions of some form. The differential diagnosis of these agnesal masses in, in women under the age of 40 should include the possibility of germ cell tumors of the ovary and also epithelial ovary neoplasm. Similarly, younger patients may present with sex cord stromal tumors. Serum biomarkers including human coronary gonadotrophin, LDH alpha fetoprotein may assist in also in evaluation of these patients. Now, how to manage a benign um, asymptomatic tumors, which are simple. The management of this benign ovarian mass is decided based on the severity of symptoms at the time of presentation, or if the patient is asymptomatic, the likelihood of malignancy. Decision on surgical and also conservative management options should also take into consideration the patient's symptoms, physical examination, age, fertility concerns, and risk factors, and in case of asymptomatic masses on ultrasound findings. So what is the initial approach of this asymptomatic pa patient with a benign ovarian mass? 
Um, the majority of masses that are categorized as B9 on ultrasound will resolve or remain unchanged over time, particularly in the asymptomatic patient. So monitoring with cellular ultrasound over short term can identify any rapidly changing masses and avoid unnecessary surgery treatment for stable masses. If a mass is determined to be low risk for malignancy, an ultrasound repeat scan is recommended eight to 12 weeks after the initial assessment. For masses that demonstrate a classic benign feature of ultrasound, the frequency of imaging can be reduced yearly to five years. Masses which are classified as indetermined on ultrasound can be managed in several ways. Follow up ultrasound eight to eight weeks after the initial scan, preferably performed at the preferred phase of the fluorescent cycle, which provides an opportunity for observe, uh, for observe observations. Also, referral to a specialized ultrasound consultant, such as radiologist or sonographer trained in pattern recognition where resources permit. So for a simple and unilocular ovarian cyst, regardless of the woman's menopausal status, simple ovarian cyst menses are almost always benign, except in rare circumstances of less than 1% malignancy risk. Most simple cyst masses, often those more than 10 centimeters in diameter, will resolve without treatment. Surgery is generally not indicated for patients with asymptomatic simple or unilateral cyst masses, at least not initially. Follow-up ultrasound can be performed annually for up to five years to detect concerning morphological features. And women with small, less than five millimeter diameter simple ovarian cysts generally do not require follow-up, as these cysts are likely to be physiological and almost always resolved within three months, three menstrual cycles. RCOG recommends women with simple ovarian cysts of B for 70 millimeter centimeter should have a yearly ultrasound follow-up. For hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, um, these are associated with corpus luteum or other uh, uh, functional cysts on, on ultrasounds. They, the mass may have a similar appearance to endometriomas, but most cysts less than five centimeters in diameter are self-limiting. And in premenopausal women will resolve over a short period of time. So repeat imaging can be performed eight to 12 weeks following the initial scan to assess resolution. And endometrioma should be considered in differential diagnosis if persistent mass is, in the, is, is happening in the context. For an endometrioma, they have a typical appearance on ultrasound. Treatment is complex and based on patient symptoms and head desire to maintain fertility. The risk of malignant transformation over time remains to less than 1%. So ultrasound can be repeated eight to 12 weeks after the initial scan, followed up by yearly ultrasound monitoring. Hematosis teratinoma in asymptomatic patient. For all asymptomatic patients with benign characteristics, ultrasound can be repeated eight to 12 weeks after the initial scan, followed by yearly ultrasound monitoring for five years. For a fibroma, initial management in asymptomatic patient involves repeat ultrasound evaluation at eight to 12 weeks. This benign solid tumor is a higher risk of malignancy than any other types of ultrasound catalyzed benign lesions, up to 12% in postmenopausal women. It is recommended to, cons um, to consider an expert consultation for management of solid tumors. What about a risk of torsion in asymptomatic benign ovarian masses? Patients with asymptomatic ovarian mass should be educated about the signs and symptoms of ovarian torsion a swift diagnosis and surgical intervention can improve the chances of ovarian preservation. It is difficult to determine the exact risk of torsion in asymptomatic patient with an ovarian mass because torsion is typically diagnosed in symptomatic patient. Three respective reviews have found that 80% of ovarian torsion occurs when the ovary is enlarged more than five um, centimeters. Coming to management of symptomatic patient now with benign ovarian mass, here, um, the goals of surgery for a symptomatic patient with a presumed benign over a mass should be, number one, complete removal of the mass, number two, reduce the risk of recurrence, and number three, preserve the healthy ovarian tissue. For a, an ovarian cyst rupture or hemorrhage, ovarian cyst rupture and hemorrhage are physiologic events involving a follicle or corpus luteum that occur during ovarian cycle. This event can be painful due to peritoneal irritation 
caused by the cyst fluid or from stretching of the ovarian capsule from hemorrhagic into the cyst. Surgery should be performed if there is hemodynamic compromise, increase hemiperitoneum, or decreasing HP levels. Persistent symptoms for more than eight, 48 hours or more after presentation, or if there's uncertainty on diagnosis or suspected torsion. On choice of surgical technique for benign ovarian mass, the laparoscopic approach for elective surgical management of ovarian mass presumed to be benign is associated with lower post-operative morbidity and shorter recovery time, and is preferred to laparectomy in stable patients. Laparoscopic management is cost-effective because of associated earlier discharge and return to work. In the presence of larger masses with solid components, laparotomy may be appropriate. Laparoscopic management of presumed benign ovaries should be undertaken by a surgeon with suitable experience and appropriate equipment whenever local facilities permit. And when an MRI um, of less than 200 as uh, 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 are suitable for laparoscopic management. Laparoscopic management of ovarian cysts in post-menopausal women should be a compromise of bilateral sapping of rectomy rather than cystectomy. And when undergoing laparoscopic sapping of rectomy, a patient should be counseled preoperatively that full staging laparotomy may be required in the evidence of malignancy is revealed. All ovaries that are suspicious of malignancy in postmenopausal women, as indicated by MRI 1 greater than or equal to 200, CT findings, clinical assessments, or findings of laparoscopy require a full laparectomy and staging procedures. <clears throat> For fertility preservation, excision of benign masses may affect the ovarian reserve. The preservation of fertility in patients with benign ovarian tumors must be considered because these tumors occur at a younger age than ovarian cancer. This is even more important in the current societal context where the desire for maternity is increasingly deferred to a later age. It is therefore the surgeon's duty to know how to approach this question with their patients in order to propose a therapeutic strategy aimed at, pro at protecting fertility. This approach comprom compromises two levels, a direct strategy, including the limitation of indications and a more conser conservative surgical procedures. Also an indirect level corresponding to the use of complementary techniques to preserve the ovarian reserves when deemed necessary. A comprehensive management aimed at preserving fertility should therefore be systematically proposed and discussed with the patients of reproductive age. The principles of conservative treatment is, oper is operative at several levels. Surgical techniques to conserve um, ovarian reserves, um, such as antimedial incision, avoidance of electrocoagulation of ovarian cortex. When the patient's fertility is particularly at risk, such as in cases of bilateral ovarian cysts, recurrence cysts with high potential for recurrence, or in the absence of already depleted ovarian reserves, um, ovarian preservation techniques may be offered to the patient. Some of these um, techniques include ovarian stimulation followed by oocyte or embryonic vitrification, Aspir aspiration harvesting of immature oocyte for a vitro maturation, surgical preservation of ovarian tissue, and lastly, harvesting of immature oocytes in vitro maturation and also um, um, commitly um, um, use. There are also medical effects of ovarian cystectomy and unilateral bilateral ophorectomy. Unilateral ophorectomy can lead to earlier onset of menopause, decreased incidence of ovarian cancer, and also subfertility. Studies have shown that unilateral ophorectomy reduces ovarian cancer by more than 30%. So bilateral ophorectomy associated with early menopause under the age of 45 produces multiple poor long-term health outcomes such as earlier death, cardiovascular disease, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and several other chronic health concerns. So it is recommended that if possible, simple ovarian cystic masses less than 10 centimeter diameter not to be removed. If patient is asymptomatic, the preferred option should be ovarian conservation where possible. 
um, briefly on ovarian mass in pregnancy. Uh, because of the widespread use of ultrasound in pregnancy, the incidence of adnexal masses found during pregnancy has increased over the last several decades. Um, although other reports quote an incidence of one in, two, in 2,300 pregnancies, newer reports find that up to 4% of patients have adnexal mass in pregnancy. Um, a small percentage of masses persists, which may raise concern for malignancy. A follow-up at ultrasound can be offered for a larger or complex cyst at around 14 to 16 weeks of gestation. Intervention should be delayed until 14 to 16 weeks to allow spontaneous resolution of functional cysts, and more importantly, to prevent surgery on uterine cysts that might be supporting the pregnancy. Persistent ovarian or paraovarian cysts may have a low risk for malignancy and can be managed conservatively. A complex adnexal mass um, which on ultrasound examination appear to be benign, such as ovarian demoid tumors, can be managed conservatively in the absence of symptoms, although patients should be made aware of the increased risk of ovarian torsion. Uh, patients um, should be informed the possibility of agent or emergent surgery, and when the risk outweighs the potential benefits of expected management, surgical evaluation should be scheduled electively in the second trimester. Um, due to time, we'll go to conclusion. Um, benign ovarian lesions are common findings in women of all ages. The management has improved with increased accuracy of ultrasound evaluation. The strategy for management takes into account patient symptoms, fertility desires, comorbidities, underlying pathology, size of the lesion, and estimated risk of malignancy. Ultrasound scan is the primary imaging modality of, the, of choice, and the use of specific descriptors and features enable classification into benign or malignancies in the majority of cases. Differentiation between benign and malignant cysts by the experienced operators or by using models such as the outer simple boost or the MRI will able prompt referral to a gynecological oncologist as necessary. Serum cancer makers may be useful adjunct but are of limited value in premenopausal age group. When surgery is indicated, the laparoscopic approach provides benefits. Um, uh, benefits and also um, reduce morbidity and recovery. The strategy for management takes into account patient symptoms, fertility desires also. All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Dweeley, for that very comprehensive overview of the topic. We are going past time. Are there any um, questions or comments from the audience? If you can just raise your hand um, on the Zoom platform. Are there any um, questions or comments from the audience? If there is any. Okay, um, thank you for your attention. Um, we have come to the uh, end of the talk. I would just like to, before we close, um, show my appreciation to one of my colleagues from the Gynae Oncology Department, Dr. Goldman, who provided his invaluable input into this talk. Thank you so much, Bart. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Merenberg. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.